I'm going to show you how to make your AI workflows completely bulletproof with a simple three-layer error handling system that prevents 95% of the most common failures that I've seen. And I've built over 150 production-grade automations for my clients, and this exact system has saved me countless calls, as well as preserving goodwill in my client relationships that would have been previously lost due to workflow failures. Because here's the thing, AI automations do break in production. It's not a matter of if they break, but when they break. The difference between amateur and professional automations isn't how fancy they look, it's how they handle the inevitable failures. So today, I'll walk you through my three-layer defense system that creates bulletproof AI workflows, including preventative measures, corrective measures, and fallback mechanisms with real examples you can implement today. Let's jump straight into it with an overview of the failure handling system. So we're going to start off with some incoming data. So we always have incoming data into our automations, but layer one is all about preventing failures in the first place or preventing the workflow from actually actually running by using these preventative measures. So it's made up of three key things here, and I'll show you in a minute how we implement those inside NAN, but we're just getting an overview now of those preventative measures. So the first is input validation, or all of it is effectively input validation or data validation. So we're going to check the incoming data and make sure that it conforms to the format that we set the workflow up to be to work with and make sure that it conforms to that before we ever run the workflow. And if it does not conform to that, and we do this format verification and data type check, input validation, if it does not conform to that, then we will throw an error at that point and we'll come to our error monitoring system later. But at that point, the workflow pr is prevented from running so that we don't run into trouble actually sending incorrect data into our workflow because we know that will return bad outputs. Now, the second part is corrective measures. So say the data is valid and correct and it passes our preventative measures and gets passed into our LLM node. We want to implement some corrective measures inside the actual node itself. And there's some inbuilt mechanisms inside LLM and that allow us to implement these corrective measures. So say the node runs but doesn't run correctly or can't connect to the service, then what we're going to do is implement these corrective measures where we effectively implement retry logic and the node reruns with spaced out calls every time it does not successfully run. This gives it a chance to potentially fix an error in running or connecting to a certain service whilst the workflow is still running and doesn't stop the workflow entirely. So say it doesn't connect to the workflow once, it will implement a retry mechanism to actually test again and again before for calling it an actual failure. So we go through this route of success, no, then we retry, and then we get to a point where enough retries prove that actually it's not going to work no matter how many times we retry, and therefore we go into our fallback mechanisms. So this is probably the most powerful part of the error handling framework and the one least people know about, which is actually how do we, if the data has been validated and the corrective measures are run and it's still failing, how do we then implement a fallback? So in our production use cases, if something has gone wrong, that we give it the best chance to actually continue the flow and work. So if the primary provider has failed, so say our LLM node has failed or open router is down or open AI is down, how do we implement fallback mechanisms where we switch to an alternate provider and try to run that prompt through an alternate provider instead? And if that works, then great, we continue with the alternate provider and actually the workflow runs. But if that does not work, then effectively you have a chain of other fallbacks as well. And then finally, we'll round up by talking about a monitoring system. So all of this is great to prevent errors and try to stop the workflow from failing in production. But it's no good if you don't have a way to actually monitor that and get real-time statistics or real-time notifications of errors coming through. So let's now jump into the actual workflow and show you how these are handled inside NAN. So let's jump into the NAN flow now here. And we have a demonstration agent, which we've called an operations agent. And this agent is effectively a tools agent we set up to take in input messages from ourselves and schedule and update calendar invites as well as respond to emails. So it's effectively an operations agent that manages all of our admin day to day with calendar scheduling and emails. So we've got a prompt in here and you can see it's a fairly well built out prompt that's quite specific, gives it the different tools it can reach out to, gives it the different instructions. So although we've built a prompt in here that's very comprehensive, there's still a chance that data passing into this will not run correctly. So the tools it has access to are effectively a web search tool, a company database in case it needs any more information. But then most importantly, it's got access to two other sub workflows. The first is a calendar tool and the second is an email tool. So I'll open up the calendar tool so you can see exactly what that looks like. And you can see this passes in here the information from the operations agent, which then goes to a calendar tool. And again, you have a comprehensive 
comprehensive prompt, which is all about creating calendar invites. So you can see with these two comprehensive prompts, how there is a potential that at some point the LLM could misinterpret some instructions because it's not running exactly the same every single time and therefore have a few errors. And that's why it's important we set up this framework for actual failure handling. So we'll start with the preventative measures. So this is also a agent to sub agent workflow. So this ops agent actually receives instructions from another agent, which is a routing agent. So the routing agent receives an input chat message from ourselves. Say we want to schedule a calendar invite, we would say to the routing agent, hey, I want to schedule a calendar invite. These are the times, etc. This is the date. These are the attendees. And we would send that through to our master routing agent, which then says, okay, I've identified that the operations agent is the right agent to run this tool or run this task and it would therefore pass information through to this operations agent. So we have a trigger here which passes that information through, which for example is the query, the user query that I put in in the first place, as well as any relevant context. So that might be meeting information that it needs to pass through in order for this to put the correct information. So our preventative measures start here in our trigger, as particularly in the executed trigger, where we effectively want to stop errors before they happen by validating and cleaning our input data. So in our executed trigger, by having a JSON example of what data it should receive in, we are already by itself validating the data that's coming in. If the data does not fit this validation JSON example from the input data mode, then effectively it will get rejected at this stage and this will fail. And that's exactly what we want because if it passes in something other than a query and context, then in our operations agent, we're not going to be able to process it because actually our inputs here are our query and context. So there's no point Point passing in information here that doesn't match our query and context into our operations agent, running that, spending the tokens, and potentially inputting or outputting fake meetings or fake emails just because we've accidentally not sent the correct information in. So by having this executed sub workflow trigger define a specific input schema, data schema like this, we are by nature validating that data at that given point. There's also other mechanisms that we can use to validate the data depending on what we're we're expecting to receive. So here we know that there's two strings being received in because actually this is purely context and it's not numbers, it's not emails or anything like that. So again, within this, we can define those data types that we're willing to accept. And if that does not conform, we will fail at this point, which is exactly what we want. We don't want the data to pass in that's incorrect or in the wrong format. This is also able to then check for null or empty values. And if those are detected, it's going to throw a failure. But we can also implement the some post conditions to validate the data. So if, for example, we were expecting it to contain email addresses, then we might have an if condition that checks for an at sign. We might have an if condition, or there are various other ways in which we could validate the data. And if those conditions are true, then we pass the data in, and therefore we start with our corrective measures. If those conditions are not true, then actually maybe we use this stop and error. And this is a node that's often overlooked, and you can find it in the standard nodes, but it will throw an error in the workflow. So it forces the workflow to stop if the data hasn't been validated there, and therefore it's preventing any failures or incorrect false positives going into our operations agent, which is more dangerous than failing early because of data issues. So this stop and error allows us to choose an error message or putting an error object. And we could simply say something like data validation failed. And what that's going to do is force at that point the workflow to stop and pass an error message. And we'll talk about where the error message is passed to in a minute, but it allows us to detect, okay, we understand that the data has failed at that stage and our preventative measures are forcing up the workflow to stop at that stage. Now, the preventative measures are probably going to actually prevent 60 to 70% of our common workflow errors. If you imagine data that's incorrect going into the next stage, that causing errors down the line is much more dangerous than actually debugging and stopping that early and preventing that data from flowing through the system. It's also really important to just create clean data throughout your entire system. So by setting up these up, we understand really clearly what our inputs and outputs or our expected inputs and outputs should be for a given AI workflow or or even just a node workflow. And by going through the logic of understanding those inputs and outputs, we can make sure that we're preventing any unwanted data in an unwanted format reaching our LLM or AI agent node. So that is the first mechanism. And like I said, that makes sure inside the ops agent we're receiving clean data. So that's the preventative measures. Now, the second part of this are the corrective measures. So the corrective measures are all about the data coming in is now working, but actually sometimes we're reaching out to an external service like OpenRouter or OpenAI or Anthropic 
Okay. And actually we're trying to run this and connect to those external systems. Now, external systems like our own systems sometimes go down and the corrective measures are designed and they're actually inbuilt into NAN workflows in order to help correct any potential issues connecting to those. So if you go into the node itself, into settings, we have this retry and fail option. And you can say, if active, the node tries to execute again when it fails. So if it fails, i.e. it's already failed, we'll try and correct that by running it again. So we can put in a maximum number of retries in here, and I'd recommend putting in three retries. And we'd probably wait around a second between retry, just the standard way to do this. Unfortunately, there's no way to say retry on one second, retry 10 seconds later, retry 60 seconds later. But what we're doing is forcing this node to retry in case we have an output that says, okay, we couldn't connect to open router. Or you've probably seen in examples where you have a particular JSON output format, where sometimes it doesn't correctly identify and put it into the output format, it fails. Now we don't want it stopping on that failure. We want it to retry and put it into that format again. And often when we retry a second or third time, it's actually able to correct itself and put it into that new format. And the corrective measures are as simple as that. We're just going to get it to retry every single time. And within the HTTP request node itself, if we're not using an LLM, for example, using the HTTP request, we have these additional options down here, which allow us to retry or batch requests, which prevent these measures from happening in the first place. So say, for example, we're trying to send too much data at once, then we can batch requests per second in order Order to comply with the API documentation and the number of requests we are allowed to send per second, for example. We can also implement timeouts here, which mean if we send a request and we don't receive a response within a certain amount of time, then it will abort the request. But if we have this combined with our retry and fail, three retries, wait a second between each, then we're able to correctively retry those as well. And the corrective measures here are great for handling things like temporary API outages. And they'll do that automatically without your workflow breaking, without you having to go in and fix that. And it also prevents the workflows from failing during brief service disruptions, which do happen from time to time. Now, if the data validation, i.e. our prevention measures, as well as the corrective measures fail, then we have probably the most powerful option next, which is fallback options. In particular, for things like LLM nodes or AI agents here, where we're relying or have so many dependencies on external services, this fallback is probably the most powerful method you can use to prevent AI workflow failures. So the fallback method starts when we have a failure in our LLM chain. And actually, what we're able to do is use the inbuilt settings for on error. So whenever an error occurs, we can show which action it needs to take when the node execution fails. And for this, we're going to say continue, but use your error output. And what that's going to do is it's going to pass exactly the inputs it received to an extra error output. So if it fails, it's going to push all the data that it received, i.e. the query and context through to whatever route we put after this. So the third way we're going to prevent failures here is actually just correct them with a fallback mechanism. So this is what I call the fallback agent. And effectively, we are giving it an alternate pathway when the primary systems fail. And what we're going to do is tackle each dependency and make sure that all of the dependencies that could have failed in our original agent have not been the cause of a failure or could not be the cause of a failure in our second agent. And in that respect, what we're doing then is reducing all the dependencies of that original agent. And if you think about the different dependencies that we've got on a specific agent, it's potentially failing on the prompt. Most of those failures would be corrected by a bit of pre-testing before it goes to production, but also running multiple times. So running it three times on failure would actually likely fix those prompt issues. And if we've tested it thoroughly, those, those shouldn't be the cause of the failure here, providing that we've got consistent results. The second is the underlying provider. So back here, we had Open Router. So we're using the OpenAI node, but we're actually connecting through Open Router to GPT 4.0. Now, with that, we have a few different dependencies. We have the fact we're depending on Open Router as a service not to go down. We have also the OpenAI model in that. So what we might choose is to actually use a different model. So we would pass exactly exactly the same prompt in here, and it has exactly the same inputs, which would be passed through to our fallback agent. So the prompt is consistent and stays the same because we've tested that thoroughly. But what we do is we'd switch the underlying provider. So say we were using OpenRouter and OpenAI, we might use Anthropic and Claude model instead, because if OpenRouter or OpenAI or that model went down, we'd actually have our fallback agent giving us entirely different dependencies there. That if, for example, OpenAI went down, we'd still potentially have Anthropic that could work. So it gives us the best chance that this would still work. Now, this would require testing the 
different models to make sure the outputs are going to be the same, but it makes sure that we actually don't have any dependencies on that service or on that model specifically. Another issue we could have there, for example, is that we don't have enough credits in our account. So we'd obviously set up our automatic backups of or credit reload in those specific accounts. But if we've not set that up, then actually maybe we have credits in an Anthropic account and our open router does not have enough credits and therefore it fails three times and we pass on to this other service here. And then the other fallback we have here is actually our NAN instance itself. So if that goes down, that's kind of mission critical. For production workflows, you might have a completely different NAN instance that you only put in your complete tested production workflows into that instance and actually have another instance which is purely designed for all your testing as well. Now, what we would do in terms of the LLM is actually connect up all of the same tools so that it has an exact access to the memory, to the tools, to everything, so that it can just run exactly as the other one ran. And then the success branch up here would also go down to the same success branch. So it gets a bit messy visually because we've got this full work agent, which has all the lines connected to the same tools. But in a production environment, it's super critical to have those corrective measures as well as the fallback measures so that in case the LLM agent does fail or when it fails, it will pass that to our fallback agent. Now, it's all good and well having these measures, the preventative measures, the corrective measures and the fallback mechanisms, but it's no good if you've got a, a no way to actually monitor and check those have run correctly. So an additional layer that we have here is our monitoring or our fixes and error notifications. So if all else fails, we at least want to know that it's failed and make sure we're there to pick up the pieces as soon as possible. So we've got a second workflow that's connected here, which is our error handling workflow. And this is made up of two things. The first is one that's standard for all of my workflows, which is at 4 p.m. daily, any workflow that I've set up that does not have a default error handler, i.e. in the settings here, is not connected to the default error handler, will automatically be assigned to this default error handler. And this default error handler is effectively this short set of nodes here, which say if an error happens in a workflow like this, for example, even this stop an error, then the error details will get passed to this error trigger. And you can find the error trigger in here, which triggers the workflow when another workflow has an error. But it's only going to do that when the default error handler like this, this workflow is connected to that workflow in the settings up here, just in here. What that's going to do is receive the error details and give us an instant notification, either WhatsApp, Gmail, Telegram, whichever your preferred communication method is. And it's going to break down exactly what has happened, which workflow failed and give us a link to that, which node failed and why did it fail. It will give us the error message and it will give us a link so we can go immediately back to that workflow. So if all else fails, we can at least see that it's failed and go immediately into it to stop any larger issues from happening. Now, inside these workflow settings, you also have a few options to prevent your instance actually breaking. And one of them is this timeout workflow. So I'd recommend for most workflows, you probably don't need more than a five minute runtime. And what that will do is that will prevent excessive load on that server from just a specific workflow. Say it's in, a, in an infinite loop where it can't fix a given problem, then it will automatically time out itself and prevent your server from crashing and all your other workflows go down. So that is it. That is an overview of the failure handling system. So we effectively have the three measures here. We have the preventive measures which validate our inputs. We have the corrective measures which make sure if our inputs are correct and we can't connect to the service that we keep retrying for a given number of retries. And then probably the most important for AI use cases in particular is getting rid of all the dependencies by putting in those fallback mechanisms. And then finally, we talked about how to actually monitor those. If you like the content, please give it a like below and subscribe. Thanks so much for watching.